Follow me, some people own stocks. Welcome to Playing Footsie, the podcast where we talk about stocks, investing, and personal finance. Before we start, we want to make it clear that the information presented on this show is for informational and entertainment purposes only. None of us is a financial advisor, and this is not financial advice. Investing in the stock market comes with risks, and we strongly encourage our listeners to do their own research and consult with a licensed financial advisor before making any investment decisions. Now, let's dive into the world of finance and talk about what we're doing with our money. The sucker's going up. Welcome to the Playing Footsie Show. I'm Steve W and I'm here with Steve D. We're in the middle of the week at the moment, but there's been so much happening, we thought we'd better get a show recorded. It's the 27th of July, the UK market's open as we're speaking, and the US market is not. But Steve, how are you? How's your week to date been going? Pretty well, Steve, to be honest. Um, today especially, having a very, very good day in the market uh, as it stands anyway. I mean, it could all go wrong from here. But uh, just looking down the list of the stuff that's open at the moment, Steve, I've got um, LSEG up about 0.8%, Adgen up 3.5% now, ASML up 3.5%, VAT Group up 4.5%, Kering up 2.5%, Sonova up 3.1%. I've been tempted to exit that one recently, Steve, so um, that, that may happen today if that keeps creeping up. But in terms of my week, Steve, I had a very pretty good week. I've been off work. I've still got a stiff neck. I don't know how this has happened. I'm sure I need a new pillow or something, but... Last night, uh, as you'll know, Steve, because you got a text at about 12 o'clock, I went to go and see Oppenheimer, and uh, I went to the late night show in the Odium. Very, very good. If you get chance to see it at the cinema, you should. Um, I wouldn't see it at home unless you've got a really, really good sound system and some accommodating neighbours, uh, because it's a noisy old film with a lot of booms and bangs, and uh, yeah, it definitely needs to be seen at the cinema, seen to be experienced kind of thing. But Steve, I, I got robbed at the cinema, would you believe? I got robbed by, um, by Odium, so I managed to buy buy sparkling water for my for my my dad uh, who's old mm-hmm. and that's all he drinks although i did ask for a fizzy water and the person behind the counter said we only do sparkling which made me <laughs> laugh uh, but yeah i had a, a, a medium coke and a, a pack of fruit pastels just a, sh- a small sharing bag of fruit pastel steep and it came to 14 quid whoa i i so cinemas are famously expensive uh, for these kind of things right but uh, but 14 quid I mean how much is inflation weighing on that I wonder I mean bags of fruit pastels back in my day uh, you went to the cinema uh, and got a medium coke uh, Steve for the people that are actually watching this on, on with their eyes I mean rather than just listening uh, roughly with your hands show us how big a medium coke is it was like this big oh okay that's that's not that big in that case so there also tend to be sort of fairly big uh, cinema sized things right you tend to get a lot of popcorn or whatever and also pay really a lot for that uh, popcorn and so on fruit pastels are you know obviously not made by the cinema but um that's oh 14 quid sounds like an awful lot steve mm. uh, hopefully we'll sometime go and talk about how it is that we make our money and and how we have money to invest and so on and one of our key plans i guess is um not spending it in cinemas but there are some expensive ones near me as well there's a uh, i think an independent ish one that sells uh, like fancy drinks and fancy sweets and they're, they're just small packets and you pay massive amounts for those as well but worth going yeah yeah definitely I mean, it's worth paying for isn't it i think the only thing that really shocked me was that there's going to come a time steve when we're going to need Klarna to pay for our snacks at the, <laughs> the cinema it's just it's just ridiculous but um i don't know i managed to pay for the cinema ticket drive and pay for the sweets as well as uh, which you know for, for for my dad which is She's all well and good. I'm sure it's supposed to be that if I drive, he gets the sweets, but he didn't play by the rules. Nope, those are indeed pretty much the rules as far as I can tell. But um, it sounds like you've had a good week. By the way, we're recording this on a Thursday for anyone that's interested because uh, by the time this comes... No, not by the time this comes out, I'll be on holiday, but I'm on holiday next week going down to Cornwall. Had a look at the weather forecast, Steve, and it is terrible. Uh, We are forecast to have, I think, one good day in the entire week, which will be the Thursday. Looking forward to that very much because we've been several times before now, but Cornwall's very, very nice when the sun's out, unfortunately. When it rains, I'm worried that we might be a total of four adults and the same number of kids shut in a house uh, together. So uh, next week's show will be pre-recorded, just for anyone who's um, interested in following and so on. But uh, I may or may not come back alive from this. There's absolutely no Wi-Fi there. I'll be doing my impression of Paul for a week. You'll need uh, many copies of Scrabble and uh, what other games you play. Game of Life, Monopoly, that kind of thing. Game of Life. I don't think I've ever actually properly played Game of Life. Really? 
Yeah, I, I, we definitely had a set when I was younger, but I remember thinking it was a worse version of Monopoly. I'll just spend my time beating them all at Monopoly because that's what we do. Capitalism. Capitalism, <laughs> but, uh, but the people I play with are probably not really capitalists. They probably don't really believe in this kind of thing. But um, anyway, should we talk about something we got wrong, Steve? We, we usually like to start the show with how our week has been, followed by something that we're wrong about, which is usually takes up the entire show, to be honest. But uh, should we talk about something we're wrong about? Was it the cricket? Uh, it's usually the cricket. That's not what I had in mind. What have we been wrong about on the cricket again lately? I didn't think there had been any. Well, you said that there would definitely be two sessions, Steve, and I said oh, yeah. it took two sessions to win. I oh, think yeah, we were, we're wrong about heading. the cricket. We are wrong about the cricket, Steve. Let's talk about how wrong we were about the cricket. Okay, what's going to happen in the final one, just so we've got something to be wrong about next week? It's two over. All, two all, England bat once. Why not? Uh, two, two all, England bat once. Interesting. I'm going to go with no result again. Uh, I'm going to go with we lose two of them to the weather. Therefore, lose the series um, and uh, start blaming the weather and so on. I was reading a BBC thing saying, uh, describing for, I guess, what you would call newer followers of the game, why does cricket stop uh, when it's wet and why can't they do something about it like play in a stadium with a roof uh, and so on or uh, have a reserve day or etc, etc. I mean, it's worth noting, I guess, that historically you think these kind of things even out over time. You get helped by weather as much as you get hurt by weather. Clearly, that didn't go England's way in the last one uh, at Old Trafford. But there's plenty of occasions when England have been either saved by the rain or pushed over the line by a rain. The 2005 Ashes, I think, ended with the final test as a draw. Australia needing a win to retain because it was rain shortened and then shortened and then shortened and then eventually uh, finished and, and match was drawn. But, uh, yeah, OK, I'm going with the idea that we will get out of this 2-1 losing, which will make Australia first uh, first away outright win in a series not just retaining ashes by drawing uh for quite a while actually mm. which would be interesting and if they do play and lose a 3-1 isn't a very good result at home that's quite disappointing two all is respectable yeah i think um yeah back, back to the point about the rain steve uh, it would be nice to have a reserve day but i think in manchester over the over this period it probably wouldn't have made much of a difference because it just carried on raining didn't it sir uh, it is a shame but it's a shame for the visual spectacle of it as well because we I've got uh, a workmate who has no interest in cricket whatsoever but over the Ashes series having somebody to ask the questions to which is one of the foundations of enjoying sport isn't it I remember when I first started watching rugby league having a mate there just to say what the hell just happened there do you know what I mean was was made me enjoy the sport a lot more and it's made him enjoy the sport but what he can't understand is that when we're going into a decisive fifth match that the fourth match was allowed to be stopped by essentially two days of rain when it was at, at an inflection point you know what I mean he said he, he said well it was probably a couple of hours away from being resolved and I said I know but that's just cricket and he was like well this is why no one watches it because it's stupid <laughs> and he's like well yeah but that is the rule well the laws yeah, it is frustrating when that happens. But when you get into these things, conditions are as much a part of a, a game as anything else, and it's kind of interesting like that, I think. Okay, so we're going to be wrong about the cricket again then, which means that I think the way in which we're wrong means England play and lose at the Oval. Uh, you've got them to play and win, and I've got them to not complete. Uh, so play and lose, and we are both wrong. So there's what to expect if you're uh, looking ahead to the next test. What else was we both wrong about? We're both wrong about the Fed, I think, Steve, but not publicly. Um, so the US Fed uh, had an interest rate decision yesterday, and both Steve and I thought they would do nothing. Uh, they did not do nothing. They increased it by 0.25% to take them to 5.5% interest rates. Um, with inflation going quite nicely, they're targeting 2%, and it's coming down steadily, steadily, gradually, gradually. In a, I don't really know what orderly means in this context, but it must mean this, uh, if, any, if it means anything. Inflation coming down in the US has been been pretty steady and orderly, and it's approaching 2%. Why would you not leave that alone, Steve, and just let that keep going for a little bit? I think it's because they've figured out this is a bit of a stimulus, Steve. I think that's what they've figured out in the US. That I think my theory of this stimulating the US economy, which is coming through in all of the figures, because mm. no one, if this wasn't stimulating the economy, there's no way America would be able to raise these rates that high uh, without... Um, without going into a massive recession uh, that the economy was was weak as it is but um i don't know steve i wonder if they're they secretly wanting to head for a little bit of deflation like a bit of oh accidental deflation just trying to write <laughs> the value of the because basically in, in if, if you think about inflation in in its simple terms it is uh, the, the value of money uh, reducing 
and then on the opposite side deflation is increasing a little bit so one of the ways that you can uh, regain a little bit of strength in your um, currency is to deflate it a little bit I guess and I wonder if that's what they're actually going to oh didn't mean to we were just we just pressed the the ouch pedal a little bit too much um, I don't know Steve it is strange to me I I, I had this long running theory that it was a kind of like talking tough but not actually uh, you know not doing tough things kind of mentality but it just seems Powell is uh, a bit of a law unto himself at the moment yeah, he does seem to be a bit of a law unto himself. You think they might actually try and like actively deflate the the currency, not just overshoot their mark on uh, inflation? Because it's one thing to think, well, we think two percent is the right amount for inflation, rightly or wrongly, and let's give ourselves a bit of room for manoeuvre, right? Let's try and take it down to one, so that if we do hit a crisis, we can always just uh, cut rates again a little bit because we can take another another percent or so in inflation. It's another thing to try and actually deflate the the currency that would be uh that would be something if that happened but would it be an interesting be- move wouldn't it because of all the nearshoring that's going on as well so uh, if things in uh, things in america are probably going to get more expensive because you would assume that a mexican wage is probably going to be more than a vietnamese wage or or something like that or maybe even a a, a chinese or even taiwanese wage that they artificially hold back their uh, well and devalue their currency don't they to to keep wages low so uh, interesting times ahead I think it's one of those things uh, you, do you remember right, when I said that um, every year I write down all of the problems that the economy's had and over the last sort of couple of years I, I wrote about 20 things when normally I just write like little bit of inflation or you know interest rates dropped 0.25 of a percent or this time it's like, interest rates went up <laughs> you know 5.5% yeah, it's all a bit nuts but it is great experience for investors and I think that's probably what everybody should take from it yeah okay so let's just go with one more thing before we kick ourselves into the the real action of today's show very very quickly are you were right about something um, Steve although I'm not sure you can necessarily remember that you were right about it Forterra uh, has announced earnings this morning. Uh, we haven't had time to have a look at them yet. We haven't done a big dive into them. There probably isn't actually a massive amount to kind of dive into here. But um, we were looking at their earnings and revenues and so on from the last uh, set. And look, if you take them from uh, a year ago's earnings when things were going pretty well in the housing market, this stock looks ridiculously cheap. Uh, if you think it's going to carry on like that, it's close to a sort of 10-ish percent dividend or something. And a high dividend yield is always an indication that the market thinks, rightly or wrongly, that that dividend is not going to prove sustainable. And if you think they're wrong, you can buy the stock. Or if you think they're just uh, underpricing, you can uh, buy the stock. Steve, you were talking about Forterra's forward uh, dividend. Do you remember what you suggested you might come up with for this or they might go for? I thought about, I think, a 40% cut today. You said uh, you said you'd be ha- the other way round. You said you'd be happy with forty percent of what we got last year. That's so right, you're yeah. thinking forty percent left, um, and you are pretty much on the mark with the profits uh, thing there. So profits came in at eighteen point one million, down from forty four point two, which is about it's about forty one percent of uh, what's left. The dividends come down from so Forterra is one that goes kind of big dividend, little dividend uh, across the year. We've just had the big dividend, so the next one is the little dividend. And that's gone down from 4.6p to 2.4p, uh, which is about 48% of what's left, but pretty close there uh, with 40%. Revenues are down by about 11 or so uh, percent, so uh, not quite as much, but but that's not a bad call. About 40% of what's left, that gives you still about a uh, between 4 and 5% dividend yield in, in what is uh, they describe as kind of weak uh, environment here, so... For Terra as a brick company, leave aside their specifics for the moment, but in abstract terms, you would take from any company a 4% return in a bad year and a 10% return in a good year, wouldn't you? Very happy with that, yeah. Very happy with that indeed, Steve. But that's not the only thing we've been right on recently. Uh, Is it we not? Probably, we deserve a little bit of credit for um, when we did our CEOs in the hot seat uh, show last year. We said that Chris Hill at Hargreaves Lansdowne was somebody we thought was very much in the hot seat. And he has since been banned from the hot seat, so he is uh, he is out or mm-hmm. on his way out, and soon to be replaced. So, Steve, we can get things right. We're like broken clocks. Yeah, I was interested in that because, I, as I remember, there have been some fairly cutting comments from like one of the founders, um, Sir Anthony Hargreaves Lansdowne, or whatever his name was. I think it was Mister Hargreaves uh, who had been 
saying this business has been running in the ground and you're doing a terrible job and you're all awful and um, I, I I don't know Hargreaves Lansdowne with a name like that and the kind of general branding and image that it has I assumed its founders were like the last century uh, or something like that and uh, I assume they were probably dead by now but uh, no, uh, it's pr- presumably a newer company than I'm aware of. But uh, there's there's movement going on at Hargreaves Lansdowne to try and turn themselves into something that isn't uh, a complete dog, I guess. Uh, I I don't know. I quite like some of the moves they've been making recently. But then that's why I'm not uh, a founder of an important business. Yeah, it's one of those fake histories, isn't it? Like where there's original, where the where there's originals always say like, "Oh, um, your granddad used to eat these sweets." Do you know what I mean? And that that was like even twenty years ago they were using like, "Oh, these are the sweets that granddad had, and his granddad had them." Well, where there's originals have only been going for fifty years, Steve. So almost no granddads have had them. So it's all it's all strange fake history. But um, uh, to be fair to well, to be not fair to Chris Hill, uh, huh. he's been carried along by uh, what is essentially um, the interest rates going up and that helping Hargreaves' his bottom line. Uh, fee cutting and things like that have been uh, something he's tried to do, but uh, Hargreaves are not competitive. And uh, I don't know. It's just I think the share price is down about fifty percent as well, Steve, from from that show as well. So that's obviously uh, driven some of the commentary, but. I just don't, I just don't think he's got anything to. It's been an unremarkable tenure at the at the top of Hargreaves Lansdowne is probably what I would say. Unremarkable feels about right though for Hargreaves Lansdowne. Feels like legal in general. You want it to be run by someone called Nigel Wilson, who I know is not uh, in charge at legal in general anymore, or is making his way out either one, um, and just do boring things and pay a big old dividend. Um, anyway, shall we talk about some? I don't know something a bit more lively uh than this let's do it so we've got a couple of things on our um agenda for today we've got a couple of us stocks that have been reporting earnings and a couple of uk stocks that have well i mean they reported earnings at some point but we're not really talking about those bits uh things we've been looking at in the uk markets one in response to a user question and another one as a sort of tangent to a user question but steve why don't you kick us off which us thing have you been looking at recently well, I've been looking at Google, Steve, and I think that was probably quite obvious to anybody who was uh, waiting for this segment to get started. Um, I thought this was a pretty strong report from Google. Um, there's still signs of um, advertising weakness, although I think that they're they're easing. Um, but I've got all the figures for you, Steve, and I've gone through the segments, and, and I've had a look at the call as well, and I've, I've pulled out 10 things from the call, which is an accident. I didn't actually... This 10 things from the call thing has just been an accident both times I've done it, but I, I feel like it should be a feature, Steve, if we can pull 10 things from every call. That would be, uh, that'd be pretty good. But uh, here we go. So revenue was uh, came in at seventy four point six billion. That's up seven percent. It'd be nine percent if you uh, if you consider FX neutral. Uh, net income came in at eighteen point four billion. That's up fifteen percent. Uh, that's a twenty five percent margin if you're interested in that. Operating cash flow twenty eight point seven billion plus forty seven percent growth margin of thirty eight percent and free cash flow of twenty one point eight billion that's plus seventy three percent margin of twenty nine percent. So uh, across the board, there financial wise, uh, very very strong, very very hard criticised. Eleven billion of stock based compensation over the uh, over the quarter Steve, which is a lot, but Google has a lot of staff. Um, I was supposed to Steve but I completely forgot to do it I was going to do SP, uh, SBC by a uh, pair employee um, for you just as a calc over the last five years but I totally forgot to do it but that might be something for people to do at home um, so look I saw the report described uh, I think it was on CNBC as slowing core fasting cloud and I think that's pretty much the case to be honest um, services revenue was up five percent advertising revenue up three percent search revenue was up five percent which is frankly amazing when you consider that chat gpt evangelist questions google's moat just this time like six months ago um youtube was up four percent network was down five percent and google cloud platform jumped 28 percent to eight billion with roughly a sort of five percent ish non-gap ebit margin so from the call, Steve, I pulled out that search ad revenue was accelerating. Um, services was led by solid growth in retail channels. YouTube growth was driven by growth in brand advertising and direct response uh, and growth in subscriptions. 
Uh, Google Cloud platform growth uh, was strong across geographies, but Google noted that consumption growth is still moderating. Uh, Ruth Porat, now you may not know Ruth Porat, but she's Google's um, CFO. She's uh, she's who's been in charge of really killing all those Google services that you tried to love but disappeared before you got chance to. So Roof moving from CFO to President and Chief Investment Officer uh, with a new CFO incoming. Um, Roof is a bit of a hatchet woman, but she's got a very keen eye for what works and what doesn't work for Google. And she acts swiftly. And if you're a Google investor, she's probably saved you billions of dollars in failed investment over the year. So I think that's a very shrewd move. I think she's quite well liked at Google and, and quite well liked here as well. So... Uh, next, it was Google's uh, AI segment. Uh, they mentioned it was their seventh year of being a super duper AI company and that they intuitively know where to use AI and where not to use it. They mentioned how they use AI in advertising and said that 80% of advertisers already use an AI powered search advertising product. Uh, and they use it in search and mentioned how it's still early days for BARD and for generative search and that these products will get iteratively better over time. They then moved on to GCP, uh, which is Google Cloud Platform AI infrastructure, and revealed that 70% of the current AI unicorns are using Google Cloud Platform, including Cohere, Jasper, and Typeface. Google said this is because they provide the widest access to Google TPUs and GPUs uh, at the moment um, in comparison to competitors. Um, I counted 90 mentions of the word AI in the call, Steve, although I got really bored in the middle and lost count twice, so I wouldn't hold me to that. It could have been less. Um, on to YouTube, Google said there's a strong mentum, uh, momentum in shorts advertising and monetization is moving in the right direction. Starting next quarter, advertisers can start testing shorts, ads and ad awareness campaigns before committing to a larger campaign. Uh, YouTube is quite excited for the potential of this moving forward. And lastly, Google reported that its YouTube ads uh, return on investment remains higher than other online video and TV channels on average after a joint study by Nielsen, TransUnion and Ipsos Mori. So, Steve, this was a very strong report. I thought there was really nothing to um, to dislike in this report. Google jumped about 6% on the, uh, on the release of these earnings as well, Steve, pushing me very, very strongly into the green. Uh, now, I think I'm up about... 15% on this uh, position now and I've no intentions of doing anything with it from here I think I'll just sit and let it let it happen what did you spot probably a good idea uh, there were two things that stood out to me uh, from this one was the Ruth Porat thing as you described her as a, a bit of a hatchet woman yes her uh, she's known for not being she doesn't tolerate people wasting money indefinitely, I guess, is the, is the charitable way uh, of putting it. And nor should she. Um, no company should tolerate things wasting money indefinitely. She might be seen to be a little bit impatient, but um, uh, clearly Google thinks that's the direction they want to go in here. And look, shes I have every reason to think she's right as often as she's wrong, at least, uh, with the decisions that she makes here. So she's now in her new role in charge of the other bets things, I think, as well, which must mean people are... I don't know, if I was at Waymo, uh, for instance, and in charge of running that operation, I'd be fidgeting a bit more than I probably was uh, before, because Waymo is, uh, it kind of waxes and wanes with the popularity of various things, but it seems like it's still some kind of way away, and I sort of wonder whether that might be uh, eventually a casualty of things. The other thing in there is Google Nest, which I imagine uh, does do reasonably well in the other bets. Um, segment those are the two that i'm kind of familiar with one at first hand the sort of nest stuff and the waymo stuff having heard a bit about it along the way but yeah uh, a, a change of role for her i think it's strictly a promotion although she was cfo anyway um but that was interesting to me and got me thinking carefully about the way google handles its other bets division come back to that in contrast to meta in a moment which i've got lined up the thing that sort of stood out to me in this was mostly what wasn't there. Uh, there wasn't that much about Bard in the um, uh, the earnings call. I had a listen. So there was a question from uh, Morgan Stanley analyst Brian Novak, I think, uh, talking about asking about how Bard and Search were kind of shaping up against one another. And Sundar Pichai answered that and effectively didn't really say much about shifting between Search and Bard. He effectively ignored that question and said they felt pretty good about the both of them. Which sort of tells me two things, I think. One is that Google doesn't really care about the difference between Bard and Search. They don't really mind which way you're kind of searching for stuff. 
The other is it tells me that Bard isn't really anything to be that excited about for Google. Um, I'm I'm sort of doubtful about this. I was always doubtful about the idea that search was kind of uh, about to be usurped by chat GPT. By the way, there are zero mentions of chat GPT in the uh, analyst call that I could tell. I counted 65. Uh, lots of the mentions of the word AI, mostly because I just whack control F just now and see and saw how many came up. So I might be missing some of them here. I was actually initially searching for barred references and I counted nine, many of which were in the prepared remarks, but analysts weren't particularly pressing on the barred thing either. So this was interesting to me, and that cloud growth uh, really kind of stands out here. It's nice to see the issue with Google has always been heavily search-reliant, heavily search-dependent. It would be very nice to add another big profitable thing to that. Um, we've talked about the kind of puts and takes of being reliant on advertising revenue before. It's high margin. Anything else would probably be dilutive to margin if you added it, and it would inhibit growth and so on. But it is all one thing, on the other hand. Uh, more and more on things that are all one thing in a moment, too. But I, I thought this was pretty strong uh, in general, and I thought it shaped up pretty nicely. Really encouraging to see cloud growth coming through was the thing that stood out to me. Yeah, pretty much. And it's key to remember that Amazon managed to build a whole business off the back of AWS and, and the, the strength of that. So if that if Google only managed a fraction of that, it'll be... Uh, It'll be accretive to what is already a high margin business, so um, it, it is an important part of the business that tapped on about ten percent of revenue as well now, Steve. Which is, it just seems to uh, seems to have snuck up on us that it's got that big that fast, but it but it is growing way faster than everything else. I think, um, in spite of all the headwinds, to see growth of you know five and three and four percent on what is already big numbers. Uh, for Google is is quite impressive, and uh, if they can keep this up, Steve, this will be uh, uh, just one of those mighty fine investments that's it's uh, ticking away. Yeah, I think I think all these could improve as well in in the face of um, you know head, headwinds being uh, reduced or removed. I think these numbers uh, will will probably start to improve a little bit as well. Yeah, you said what I was going to say. Actually, I I sort of feel like the success we just talked about a little bit of the US in handling its inflation fairly well and and staying out of recession for the time being has been uh, that's been helping uh, ad spend basically ad spend tends to be cyclical and and the better things do in the economy the better it is for cyclical ad spending so so good work for uh, Google and yeah you'd take 7% revenue growth in any given year I mean all they've got to do is keep buying stuff back and, and keep the stock based comp under control I know that that's not easy to do and we're not talking about Microsoft on this show particularly neither of us owns it um, although I think both of us think it's pretty good uh, and a uh, strong company and, and nothing really bad to say about it but Microsoft is a, a company that has basically defied age and the natural process of time and continued to keep itself relevant in various different ways and they have done that by heavily reinvesting in stuff pretty much all of the time um, Amazon is continuing to do the same thing but Google here, it's not as straightforward as just using this stuff to uh, to keep buying buying back shares. They, uh, they're doing a good job growing revenue, but they're doing that by a decent amount of kind of reinvesting into mostly employees and staff, I think. Yeah, key to remember as well that um, it was only last quarter that Google authorized a seventy billion dollar buyback. Um, mm. So there's plenty of um, there's plenty of ammo in the uh, in the buyback cannon. So. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about stock-based compensation here. Yes, it's high, uh, but the argument here being that Google needs the absolute best talent to remain at the top, and one of the ways that you, um, you know, you you keep talent um, is by uh, is by offering good stock-based compensation. Now, the last time I calculated stock-based compensation by employee was about four years ago. It was about ninety k on average. Steve, uh, but obviously that average is out there. You know, people like Sunder Pichai who are getting obviously a lot more than um, you know Joe Bloggs who cleans the toilets. But um, I think he still got getting fired recently, though. Yeah, probably. But yeah, so it, it is a lot of stock-based compensation. But um, even if they did eleven billion a quarter, which seems unlikely, um, they'll uh, they'll still be whacking out nearly double that uh, in terms of buybacks. Yeah, I mean, so the stock was up about 5.5% yesterday or so on its kind of news. It's, uh, that's, 5.5% moves can sometimes be more than they seem, as it were, in the, this is after a year, uh, 44 or so percent up year to date. I mean, it's leading, in that kind of class of stuff, leading the S&P. It's not the uh, the biggest gainer in the S&P, but 
It's not like that's been falling into earnings. Sometimes all you find with a big jump is that these things are correcting from previous kind of pessimistic explanations. It's not a million miles from kind of all-time highs at the moment, just as I look at these things. It's probably only within about 10 15% of that or so. And it's, yeah, I mean, I think probably not too far until we see new highs for Google on this. No, I don't, I don't think so either. I think... Um... I think it's doing perfectly well, and probably ex- you would expect it to to get there. It's definitely not a business in decline like we were told it would be. Um, so let's just see it. Let's just see it happen. Yeah, let's just try another business as well that we that was we were told might be in decline. It turns out it isn't, and is also doing quite well this year. Every time we talk about Google, it's usually the case that Meta Platforms is not far behind. That's not by accident. There are two reasons for that. One is they tend to report earnings at about the same time. Another is that they tend to do pretty similar things, which is online advertising and. Meta Platforms is another story of a stock that up after earnings. They reported last night, bearing in mind that it was Thursday, uh, and they were up between 7 and 8% in um, pre-market trading when I had a look. That's to add to 140% of gains year to date. So what's been going on there? Pretty much similar. So revenue came in at $32 billion, which is up 11%. Earnings per share came in at $2.98, which is up 21%. Uh, good top and bottom numbers then or at least encouraging looking top and bottom numbers they raise their guidance i think which is slightly higher than analysts were expecting but user numbers are also up pretty much across the board whether it's daily active users monthly active users facebook or across the family of apps this is significant for meta and there's a reason it's kicking on more than google uh here and it's the reason for them is it shows that their kind of q1 uh report which was the first First really positive, well-received report they've had in a while, in about a year or so, wasn't a one-off. So what we've been seeing for a little while now is wind this back sort of two years uh, or so. And in um, coming out at the end of 2021, the stock's been doing terrifically well. Um, And it's been going gangbusters, especially on the family of apps uh, metrics. Pretty much all of those are strong. Q2 2022, three consecutive quarters of revenue declines year over year. Um, followed by in the second quarter, I think, of 2022, so a year ago now, a decline in the number of, I think it was, daily active users on Facebook specifically. Uh, And suddenly the sky is falling in on Meta and they're busy throwing all their money down this Reality Labs hole and the company's not making anything uh, and TikTok is going to come and kill them and Apple is going to come and kill them and everybody's basically going to come and kill them. Uh, and then things started looking up in the last quarter or so. And the people, by the way, when it was uh, looking under pressure, were saying, yeah, but tough comps. Yeah, but there's still loads here. Yeah, but so on and so forth. Mainly, though, the market was going the other way. Um, and last quarter's Q1 quarter came out strong, which kind of lent some credence to the idea that actually, yeah, 2022 was just a tough year for a company like Meta up against tough comps in 2021. If you put up massive revenue numbers, what that means is that your next year is that much harder to have big growth numbers. Oh, well. Um, But the question then was, okay, is Q1 an accident or is Meta out of the woods? And it's way, 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 way too early to tell on that, I think. But this uh, bunch of earnings indicates that it might be kind of more out of the woods than anything else. So good uh, on the subject of uh, revenue and profits, good on user numbers, costs came down as well, although we'll come back to that in a little bit. Mark Zuckerberg, I think, said some stuff that maybe people ought to be a bit cautious on uh, in that one. There is a big elephant in the room, though, uh, at least for my money anyway, and that's at Reality Labs. Uh, So Meta is now going through its kind of year of efficiency, uh, as Zuckerberg calls it, and he said... Year of efficiency set to continue uh, in the second half of 2023. No one told the people at Reality Labs, uh, it seems. They lost even more money than they usually do. Normally, they're ch- well, normally. This time last year, they chucked 2.8 billion out the door, uh, like it was sort of nothing. That, that went up to sort of 3.7 billion out the door. Uh, higher revenues, but, <laughs> but still less to show for it. And uh, the guidance is that they're not going to stop there. They're planning on widening losses and or expecting losses to widen through 2024. They are building out their products. They are building out their, what they call their ecosystem. Um, interesting. So to my mind, I sort of think anyone that was worried about that ought to still be worried about that. And by anyone that was worried about that, I mean me. Uh, I was worried about that. And I now feel worse about that than I previously did. Uh, Cost came down, but that was partly due to some of it being pushed into 2024. Their wage bill is set to go up as they bring on more and more technical and specialist uh, people, so higher wages needed there. 
My own view on this, Steve, is I like this stock a lot better at $128 and a PE of 11 than I do at 300 and a PE of about 38 or so. I get that there are some threats that are not threats anymore. The Apple privacy thing looks like it's not a threat anymore because blah, blah, AI. Um, the TikTok thing is actually significantly less of a threat than it was before. Uh, and that's no doubt helping uh, user numbers along. The economy is in better shape for the US than it was before. All of that's a genuine positive. I eventually gave up on this a little while ago and sold it when I thought the risk reward wasn't there on the Reality Labs stuff. If I thought that before, I'm unlikely to think it's better now at these prices, and I don't. Reality Labs are set to lose more money, and it just costs more to buy shares. So I think I'll leave this one for the time being, but I am pleased for everyone who's still uh, in there, although I got off the train a little while ago. Uh, anything stand out to you? I thought it was... Fairly sensible, uh, what you're saying there, Steve. I think this is a def- definitely a different kind of risk profile now to uh, buying it back um, when it was trading at essentially 10 times earnings or whatever it was. Um, that was one of those occasions where not really an awful lot had to go um, right for you to, to make some decent money out of it. So I'm just looking at the, uh, <clears throat> the profiles now, Steve. So they reckon they've got about 70... Uh, 9% of monthly active people or daily active people as well and that's been static for a very very long time here so this isn't a this is across the family of apps of course it's not across Facebook um, so the, uh, every sort of stat on here is trending in the right kind of direction so this is exactly what you want I mean the, the problems of net income falling down well net income's essentially double diluted earnings per share you didn't like it at $1.64 well it's now two ninety eight. and capex is uh, they say it's coming down a little bit, but in terms of year to date, it's uh, it's up a tiny bit, but it's relatively flat in in, in terms of what you would expect um, from them. Uh, daily active people growing. It's been two point seven six billion uh, across the family of apps. It's now three point oh seven billion. There's not a lot in here that you could really look at and and really criticise uh, Meta if you if you didn't like their report when they're at, um, ten times earnings. Well, the business has clearly improved now. Uh, and its valuation should have improved improved with it, but should it have improved to the rate that it's at today? That's a different question, isn't it? Uh, it's probably moved from being significantly undervalued and people assuming it was under threat to being probably overvalued now, um, and that just doesn't make it a buy from PSC. Interested in a couple of the partnerships that were announced off the back of this, though. I don't know whether you saw those. Uh, teaming up with Microsoft on an AI project uh, called Llama 2, which will be on Azure oh, yeah. and Windows. And the other one that I noticed was um, Meta, Microsoft and Amazon to, uh, they basically want to release an open map data set to rival Google and Apple Maps. Now, I can't see a point in doing that, Steve. Google Maps and Apple Maps are perfectly fine. I think that's a waste of money. Um, but and I don't really see where the money comes from from google maps and apple maps it feels like a bit of a vanity project to me and not something i would want any of those companies to really be involved in what could you do that makes it better that's that's my point and if you can't make it better what's the point in doing it at all yeah i don't have answers to either of those questions i don't use apple maps um mostly because i don't have an iphone i think apple maps is probably on this mac somewhere that i'm talking to you on but i don't really need that and google maps is something i'm sort of fairly fairly well entrenched into uh, to be honest i use it driving around in the car i can't be bothered with a sat nav system so i tend to go with with google maps um and like you say it seems to work pretty well and do sort of most things it's it's also got quite a big head start on a lot of the other things i think there's a lot of kind of data points on there that are that are fairly helpful i don't know why you want to have one of these things particularly With the AI stuff, um, I tend to be a bit sort of wary uh, on AI that I understand very clearly either what it looks like going forward or why it's valuable or how much money is in it. But one thing that I guess I am mindful of is that there are some big, big companies. This is not kind of a race for brand new um, uh, things. This is big, big companies with a lot of cash and that are not afraid to go and invest cash either into doing well in this. So both google and meta if you wanted to back somebody to have better ai kind of blind i.e without being an ai technician or expert or something you probably pick the ones with the big piles of cash that keep keep growing to to some extent and are available to deploy wouldn't you as an ai pick yeah i think um 
look, Meta's been involved in AI for a really, a really long time. When I read um, Genius Makers, um, mm. I was surprised to see just how um, how sort of competitive uh, Meta were in in this space, and how desperate they were at times to to try and have a product that rivaled. Um, you know the likes of Google and and Amazon and what have you, and I, I don't feel like they've had that sort of killer product in the way that um, the others have had yet. But interesting to see that they are at least competing on this front. I would, I would hate to be somebody like OpenAI in this kind of fight when you're fighting against these just absolute monster companies who can at any point just decide to copy and switch on and and develop a product that just completely wipes you off the face of the earth. To be fair, that's the sort of old amazon adage isn't it whenever they used to move into an area that was uh to start competing with somebody all the shares in that industry would just collapse because they knew how aggressive amazon could be in in basically beating you out of a market so i agree with you there steve to 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 be honest i think um i think there's interesting times ahead if ai kicks off in the way that it is but it's just going to make these big companies even bigger I think so. Meta, I think, has done a pretty good job recently, as has, uh, well, sort of as has Google. I'll come back to Google in a second. But Meta, I think, has done a decent job of defending its territory in this kind of platform space. It's done a pretty good job of things like Instagram Reels and so on and so forth and and fending off that threat from TikTok. I know they got a bit of a push from uh, TikTok being banned on kind of its US uh, government officials, partly state level and partly federal um, level, having... uh, tiktok banned there that'll help but i do think they've done a decent job of defending on instagram i was going to say the same is true of google defending with bard against chat gpt but it's not obvious to me that either bard or chat gpt is doing is doing terrifically well uh, which i didn't give it away in the comments particularly it's not uh it's not clear that that was just a kind of less of a threat than it seemed like it was in the first place rather than uh, super defensive work from Google doesn't really matter which one it is right they stay in a strong position at the end of it either way whether it's because the threat wasn't really a threat or because they had enough to push it away again but uh, yeah uh, these things seem uh, to make a very obvious point they seem kind of moti uh, both um, alphabet and meta here yeah well moti are then people seem to give them credit for yeah but that's I mean, a better just, way of putting it I think just a couple of years ago people were talking about these companies having an impenetrable moat and a, uh, open AI, AI and chat G, uh, GPT came along and people decided that these moats had just dissolved overnight and I think we said quite a lot of times on the show Steve and sort of snorted with derision at the uh, the idea that um, something like this could just come along and destroy Google's business overnight I think that's incredibly unlikely um and has thus proven to be so mm. i think that's quite enough excitement for one show steve uh should we talk about some uk stocks instead let's do it Shall okay I start with mine yes tell us about your very high-tech company you've been looking at okay uh so uh last week or it might have just been in the week before sam late friend of the show uh asked me if i if i well if me and steve were back buying bmy uh, and by bmy he would mean bristol myers squibb which is a stock that steve and i had quite a lot of success with a couple of years ago we predicted that the pipeline would uh, come through and um, i remember paul referring to it as a future wall of earnings and uh, in that regard we were <clears throat> we were completely correct about that and that's what happened and the business increased in valuation from probably the sort of mid to low uh, mid 50s to low 60s the business increased to the high 70s and i think that's probably when the vast majority of us got out of it and made a decent uh, amount of money out of it uh so i searched for bmy uh, because sam had alerted me to this obviously saying that it had fallen in price quite a lot and when he did i was alerted to bloomsbury publishing uh, who also have the ticker bmy in the uk a, a company I know really well, but I had no idea it was publicly traded, so I thought I would take a quick look at it. Uh, so sorry, Sam. Uh, I know you probably got excited about us doing a Bristol Myers Squibb update there, but sorry. Um, so yes, Bloomsbury Publishing. It's a leading independent publishing house with offices in, offices in London, New York, Sydney, uh, Delhi, and a joint venture office in Beijing, uh, China. It was founded about 36 years ago in 1986 and went public in 1995. Its primary function is uh, that of a book publisher and a book financier. 
Um, so look, I'm getting early, uh, why should I care vibes? So uh, let me tell you one thing quickly to get you back on side. They're the publisher of the Harry Potter series of books. So uh, yes, I hear you straight away. That book, that book series is like a decade old, Steve. Well, actually, it's a quarter of a century old. Uh, so that's made you feel older, hasn't it? But uh, would you believe that the Philosopher's Stone, which is the first in the series to the uninitiated, uh, it was actually number four on the children's best-selling list last year. Uh, so the cultural impact of Harry Potter lives on. And I think Bloomsbury have done an excellent job at elongating the life of the Harry Potter books. So looking at the financials, they're pretty good. In terms of revenue uh, last year, it grew 15% to $264.1 million, which is actually only 9% if you remove a pretty sizable acquisition they, they took on board. Uh, PBT, which is a favourite UK metric, it just means profit before tax, uh, rose 15% to $25.4 million, although I've wrote 25.4%, I'm pretty certain it's $25.4 million. Um, Diluted earnings per share came in at 30.5p uh, per share, which allowed a dividend of about 10.34p per share. Uh, very well covered. And uh, net cash position improved to 51.5 million, which is a, a raise of 25% over the previous year. In terms of revenue split, they're pretty diversified. 41% children, um, 41% of revenue is, is derived from children's um, book sales, 22% from adult, 29% from academic, and 8% from special interest. So yeah, in terms of reader segments, they're they're drawing revenue from from a number of areas. Uh, valuation wise, you're looking at a PE ratio of about 17.3 uh, on a backwards looking basis. Uh, it's about flat on a year basis because they're not expecting a, a large increase in earnings. So, uh, you know, you're looking at about 17 times earning. A dividend, just, just for argument's sake, is 2.72%. So uh, it's not a massive dividend for, for the UK economy, but um, it is what it is. Um, but it's not just J.K. Rowling they have on the books, pardon the pun. Uh, they have TV chef Paul Hollywood and TV chef Tom Kerridge. Uh, they have the New York Times number one bestseller Sarah J. Mass. She did the Throne of Glass series. They have um, Neil Gaiman and his works including Stardust, uh, Good Omens and Coraline if you've seen the film. In terms of special interest, they produce the Wisdom Cricket Almanac, uh, the Writers and Artists Yearbook, and they also do all of the publishing for the RSPB and the National Trust. Uh, their main growth driver at the moment is the academic section, which is growing rather quickly. Uh, in the latest reports, they highlighted revenue increases of 28% over the prior year, profits growing at 37% to 12.4 million, meaning margins have essentially doubled in the last five years in this segment. And this is because digital sales have begun to overtake the physical side now and represent about 52% of sales in this segment. Um, they're also continuing to invest in audiobooks. Um, revenue in this sector increased 31% year on year with Stolen Focus by uh, Johan Harry uh, leading the way for them. It's also named uh, Audible's best audiobook of the year last year. Um, so pretty interesting looking outfit to me, Steve. Um, full disclosure, I, I within a couple of days, I'd picked up a handful of shares here, Steve, and I actually have a view to building out a decent sized position in this. I chopped Spirak Sarko for it, um, mainly because Spirak Sarko had uh, gone up about 18% in a week and a half after I bought it, and I was like, oh, this is not the price I want to pay for it. So I, I cut that position. Um, Spirax is at 30 times earnings as well. I cut that for 17 times earnings. Uh, I would encourage people who are interested to take a trip to their investor relations page because their presentations and reports are very high standard, very in-depth, and do help to explain the business uh, pretty clearly. But yeah, one I'm very interested in at the moment, Steve. Yeah, interesting stuff. Uh, I was trying to work out what I think of... Um harry potter as as the kind of big driver of things and i'm sort of torn between two thoughts here i guess one is on the one hand i think these things are likely to get kind of handed on a little bit from generation to generation and my wife and i now that we've got a sort of little and we're finding we have quite a few copies of the same book not necessarily harry potter but stuff like from the sort of children or young adults literature things like the uh, northern lights trilogy and so on we both have a copy of that we don't need two sets uh, of that so one of them can go i wondered whether that would be a kind of headwind here maybe i think um but they're pretty good at kind of adding little bits onto these harry potter things whether it's new dust jackets uh, add on um bits of literature around it things that can kind of 
build onto um, things. And I wonder whether my my initial thought was that maybe the films will prove to be more enduringly popular than the books. Maybe. I mean, it might well be the case that kind of uh, kids now they kind of find their way in via the films and then get to the books afterwards. I, in general, have not enjoyed or really struggled with films that have been made on books that I've already read the book of because where I thought oh, I thought it was a really good book I'm interested in the film it tends to be that bits from the book are inevitably uh, left out of the film because they have to be and I understand that and people make choices and those choices are probably defensible but I always feel sort of faintly disappointed that I don't get the same kind of experience from the book that I get from the uh, sorry from the film that I got from the um, book so I think there's uh, it's interesting watching kind of Harry Potter I'm going to go home after this by the way I am not in my house I do not have this kind of BMP banneridge in our uh, place but I'm going to go home after this and uh, probably turn over all of Alice's books and see who's publishing these things because the children's book market is interesting to me and I think what we have at the moment is a core set of pretty popular fairly enduring uh, children's titles that I think probably do stand the test of time like many do Harry Potter likely will but I'm interested in who publishes those as well academic segment is something i know a bit better and a bit closer to uh from work and i'm not surprised to see it kind of going digital uh wise here it's sort of tricky with bloomsbury anything that isn't something university press and usually something big university uh press is not normally regarded as kind of the top tier of um academic publishing and i say that as someone whose book is published with routledge uh, so not um one of those uh, university presses but there is usually a uh, good supply on one side of these things and that people need to write stuff for their academic careers and they need to be uh, publishing and they need to be writing books and the university presses can only take so much there's a lot of people kicking around in academia probably more than there needs to be uh, writing at the moment probably include me in that category too but it's always likely that you will find a buyer for these things in the form of some library or another because libraries have budgets they are for those of us who work in universities we are constantly being told to recommend things for the library to buy they usually have more money than they know what to do with what they don't have usually uh, and this kind of helps maybe give a bit of color to what you were saying steve is more space than they know what to do with uh, so they're very keen to buy books and have subscriptions available to stuff and they want to know what they should be making available to students, but they don't really have places to put it very much. The, kind of, the more books you acquire, the more real estate you need to kind of keep them in. And that doesn't go down terribly well. So what goes down well is stuff like digital versions of things. It doesn't surprise me that digital stuff is overtaking physical stuff here. Digital, I would assume, to be like higher margin. I can't remember whether you said that or not for uh, Bloomsbury, but cost of sending out something much, much, much cheaper than cost of printing and binding uh, something here. So... So I guess none of this surprises me. I do actually own this in, not strictly in my portfolio, but there are Bloomsbury shares with my name written on them, uh, so to speak. I own it for one of my godsons based on his idea that what he likes is, not his idea, the idea I got from uh, people who make decisions for him, uh, that what he likes is books. So I thought, let's go pick him up some shares in Bloomsbury and see how they get on. They've not done terribly well so far, I think. I'll have a quick look and see how mine have got on. I've had them for a, a few months or so, but this is one that I've looked at at least enough to to buy it for somebody else at this point yeah back to your uh, earlier point Steve about them doing a very good job of Elon getting the Harry Potter series one of the ways they've been able to do that is by re releasing very uh, a lot of different versions of it so they've got They've done things like update the artwork, update the jackets, update the dust jackets. And then they've also been able to, because it's 25 years on, go back to the original artwork now and um, re-release -re all of the original artwork. But they do uh, a lot of Harry Potter gift sets. They do uh, a Hogwarts uh, house version, which is more focused on the four houses that are in um, in the Harry Potter series. Uh, they also do fully illustrated versions for younger children, so there's a lot more pictures and things like that involved in them. So they've done a very, very, very good job of sort of elongating the um, the, the sort of sales cycle of, of Harry Potter and keeping it uh, keeping it relevant. So um, you can see that just the amount of time they've spent on doing this will be attractive to other authors that have big selling titles because they think, look, if Bloomsbury are doing all of this work to just keep churning out these sales for obviously both for bloomsbury and for the author i imagine what they could do with my uh, my best-selling book um mm. so yeah i think it's it's pretty attractive um looking offering it's a it's a great bit of marketing for bloomsbury to keep this keep this up and alive um 
Uh, I just think it looks uh, attractive here, Steve, even if you think that Harry Potter is just going to eventually dwindle away to nothing, which is something we, you and I, Steve, have spoke about uh, offer. It's not dropping off a cliff. It's kind of in the way that you would think about Bristol Myers Squibb bringing it all back full circle, is that these drugs, when they run out of pattern, they don't drop off a cliff. They, they, they slowly slowly dwindle away to nothing um, while the generics get made and, and, and replace them. But what happens here, being a book publisher, is all the revenue from Harry Potter they can use to reinvest in other authors to bring them along. And I don't think you're going to see like a Bloomsbury come back and say, look, we just didn't sell any Harry Potter this year, so revenue is down 95%. That's not going to happen because what they're doing is as Harry Potter tails off, they're bringing other authors along and uh, eventually that revenue from Harry Potter will go to nothing, but it won't make a difference because Bloomsbury will have fully, re uh, fully replaced it. Yep. Um, on their academic side, actually, if they can launch textbooks and this sort of thing, so leave away from side the, the kind of academic journal publishing stuff, Textbooks are really handy because you tend to be able to update those with new editions every so often. Sometimes that's justified, sometimes it's not, quite frankly, but but there is often opportunity to uh, to get what you might loosely call recurring revenue uh, in this kind of area. It's that, that's I guess I can see the attraction there uh, from Bloomsbury's perspective. Should we should you got anything else? Or should we move on for one more? Let's move on. Last one. Okay, last one then, and it's primary health properties. So we spoke a couple of weeks ago now about DS Smith, a uh, box ticking company in the UK. Uh, Alex Copland, who asked us about that, also asked us about what he called PHP uh, properties, and I didn't immediately clock what that was. I know PHP is primary health properties is a ticker symbol, but I there are a lot of kind of REITs and so on that just go by initials uh, that are... Um, I, I thought I hadn't heard of PHP, but I had. It's primary health properties. Uh, FTSE 250 stock been going down and down and down since the start of the year. Uh, and they are a REIT. So get your uh, REIT thinking hats on for the moment then. They specialize fairly obviously in primary care uh, buildings, which just to be kind of clear about what that is, those are supposed to be kind of first point of contact with health professionals. So they're things like in the UK and Ireland, which is where their uh, assets are based, GP surgeries and health centres. I had a look at a map to see where their kind of properties are located, and they're scattered all over the country, basically. But there are sort of three that are kind of appear to have a fairly high concentration. That's in the southeast, so if you think sort of bottom right from London uh, mm. a little bit, uh, there's 90 or so properties they have there, 65 that are somewhere between Sheffield and Manchester in that sort of Pennine corridor thing. Um, and 62 that are sort of just underneath Birmingham, so slightly further up than, than me here. But spread out reasonably well around the UK and uh, some in Ireland as well. So when we think about REITs then, uh, we think about metrics like occupancy ratios and collected rents and uh, where all that rent comes from and how long it's got to run and so on and so forth. Um, and primary health properties actually a bit like Bloomsbury are pretty good at making this information available uh, for you. It's not always easy to get out of some companies exactly what their occupancy ratios are, probably because they don't want you to know. Uh, and on the other side of that, primary health properties are prepared to tell you because they do want you to know. Uh, so keep that in mind. But their occupancy, this is from their most recent earnings update, which was basically the halfway point of this year. So about uh, four weeks ago by the time this goes out. Uh, occupancy rates are about 99.6%, which is pretty darn near full. That was more or less steady from the previous year. Collected rent was about 98%, so that's also pretty high and well up there. Uh, as you would expect from somewhere operating in this kind of sector, 89% of their uh, rental income comes from some or other government arm that's worth considering. We talked about Google as maybe something concentrated around search, and then you ask yourself two questions. One, how likely is that to get disrupted? And two, how serious would it be if it gets disrupted? And the answer they're wanting to say is, um, well, it would be it would clearly be extremely serious if this got disrupted somehow. And they also think it's pretty clearly not going to happen. Um, whether you believe them or not on that is another question. I suppose there is an existential threat from the likes of uh, Teladoc. Um, not necessarily in the UK, but if you think what we're going to see is a lot less in the way of GP offices, as they call them in the uh, states, surgeries as we call them in this country, and a lot more kind of online health stuff, I'm not convinced by that personally myself, and what I think of that is is unclear, although I'd be prepared in either direction to put money down with the right odds. 
Uh, that's the kind of thing I guess that you might want to be aware of here if you suddenly think that demand for uh, GP properties will go down. Um, their rental income is 75 million uh, for the first six months of the year. That was up 6% from 2022. Their net income, um, so rental income and net income are very different in the case of REITs because of, well, a number of things, largely depreciation, but their taxable net income stuff is 45 million. We don't tend to view that as a good way to value a REIT, but what it is relevant to is their dividend because that's the 90% of that is what they pay out to shareholders. So their dividends weren't going out with 44.8 million, 2% and 3% higher respectively. Okay, so there's a starting thought on some REITs. Here's another thing we always worry about when we worry about REITs. Because they can't retain earnings, they can't grow very easily. They have two ways of growing. One is by increasing their share count, and the other is by taking on debt. Uh, So we tend to find that they have fairly heavily leveraged balance sheets, and this is offset by some decent visibility about future earnings. You can take on the debt because you can see very clearly how you're going to pay that out from rent that you're basically due here. Uh, And primary health properties has a lot of debt, even by the standards of a REIT. Uh, We assume REITs have leverage balance sheets, and this one does. This is, even by REIT standards, quite a bit of debt for this company. About $1.3 billion in total debt was the amount I was finding here. Um, And about $40 million a year in interest expense, so that's quite a bit of your $75 million in rental income going out again on that. The real question then, uh, by itself, that is what it is. Um, you could be take, you could be tempted to take that at the right price. You could think the price was wrong in any situation. But the question is whether there's a problem coming because rising in interest rates are going up and you don't have to be uh, particularly switched on to know that this is creating problems for people who own properties. And it can create problems in a couple of different ways. One is it can mean interest payments go up, i.e. mortgage rates go higher and they have to work out how to suddenly make higher repayments that maybe they can or can't make. The other is that the value of their properties goes down, which can put them in breach of loan to value covenants uh, here. Primary Health are declaring themselves to be reasonably safe on both of these counts. Make of this what you will. Uh, so do your own thinking in this uh, situation. Seven years is their kind of big number uh, to think about here. They have a, a seven year at least visibility plan. That's the average duration of their loans that are going to mature. Nearly all of them, by the way, are between 5 and 10, uh, from what I could see when I was looking through it. So 97% of their debt is fixed or hedged for the next seven uh, years or so. The average cost of that debt is 3.2% per year, which I think a lot of people trying to get mortgages now would be pretty pleased uh, with 3.2% if you could get it somehow. And they have 42% loan to, uh, to fall before, or at least as of the end of June, sorry, they had 42% to fall before they started getting into covenant breaches. So they think there's a way to go yet. Last issue then, growth uh, with REITs. If you can't retain earnings, you have to take on debt. It can be quite hard to grow uh, as a a REIT. And I think think that might be true uh, here. They have a bit of a kind of pipeline coming through, but their net tangible assets value at the moment is about 15% higher than their current share price. So you're buying underneath tangible book value, albeit... Rising interest rates might cause the value of those to fall, so you should keep an eye on that. Their dividend yield is just under 7%, uh, and if you think at those kind of levels and you believe this is a durable business, you might ask yourself how much you really do need it to uh, grow. You could take a little bit from a sort of steady 6% return, and if you can stay out of trouble, you might be okay. That's the way I would think about primary health properties here. It's below a quid, um, which gives you a return of 6 point something high percent, uh, at least as I'm talking to you at the moment. Uh, it's it's kind of tempting to me, uh, to be honest. Um, Steve, if you can see your way through the kind of risks with this, and there are genuine risks here, the thing is cheap, and it keeps coming down, and it keeps getting that bit more cheap and that bit more tempting, uh, to be honest. What do you think? Yeah, but just looking through the debt pile now, um, and it is a debt pile, um, it is not the worst managed debt pile I've ever seen in my life. It's uh, there, are, there are some elements to it that, are, that look expensive, thinking historically um, uh, mainly the average cost of debt being at 3.8% if they fully draw down which doesn't sound like a lot at the moment but you've got to remember that this business has been going for quite a long time when debt was essentially free so for it to be in the getting on for 4% is is quite high considering they've only got about 300 million that they haven't they haven't drawn down yet so 
it's not too bad. Uh, it's not too bad. It is, it's just a little bit high. Um, looking down the list of things, loan to value, um, if you include this convertible bond, is about 45%, Steve. So there's a huge drop in valuations there before you're looking at any kind of uh, negative equity kind of situation here, which mm. I, I wouldn't think you would. I mean, if you're seeing negative equity as a potential in a REIT, then you're looking at the wrong REIT, I would guess here. Um, but yeah, an interesting looking company. I have looked at this company before, and when you mentioned it to me, I, I straight away said hospitals, but I was I was wrong. It's more, it's more doctor surgeries, isn't it? But um, an interesting looking company i'm just looking at the convertible bonds now so con uh, convertible bonds six year term uh unsecured nominal value of 150 million coupon of 2.875 percent per annum you'd take that now wouldn't you um bonds convertible into fully paid ordinary shares at the company the initial exchange price was uh one pound 53 and a quarter of a penny so there is uh uh interesting exchange price coming up when that uh when they choose to convert that that would be quite a hefty amount of dilution if the price drops uh, any more, but um, yeah, interesting looking company, Steve. I'm quite taken by the early look at it. Yeah, so the kind of lazy thing to compare it to, I guess, is Medical Properties Trust that some people own. That's kind of based in the in the states. I think they're quite different for a couple of reasons. So MPW, as that stock is known now, that is hospitals, as I understand it. And here's one difference that i've heard pointed out here or at least that i've or at one point i've heard made about mpw which doesn't apply to php but i'm not sure how much hay you want to try and make out of it hospitals are quite different difficult to convert to anything else if you if for whatever reason your kind of occupier on a hospital went away you would have to find another one i mean it's it's hard to then try and turn it into i don't know flats or offices or whatever you'd probably have to knock it down and start again Doctor surgeries may be easier. I'm not sure I want to make much of that particular point, by the way. I mean, it would be weird to kind of get into um, either of these, which are clearly medical facilities, broadly speaking. Reach to say, yeah, but if the medical thing doesn't work out, we could always go and do something else with it. I mean, that seems to me like... Um, that seems like a really bizarre uh, way of thinking about this. They have This isn't kind of a diversified operation that owns a bunch of different stuff where you say, well, look, if we stop doing this thing, we could keep doing more of the other thing. We could clear it out and, and build out our kind of industrial arm or, or something like that. Uh, these are pretty specialist things. They're committed to being what they are. Um, and in the case of primary health, I sort of feel like they um, they at least have a decent idea of what they are and what they're about. They have a healthy understanding of their own risks. Are they going to get them all right? Don't know. Uh, are they going to be surprised by something in the future? Almost certainly. But they do have a decent kind of sense of self-awareness, I think, here. And that, that kind of encourages me with the company. Yeah, just looking down the, the risks that they're listing on here and, and things that they've um, they've been testing. So they've been stress testing um, their balance sheet at the moment. So they've been doing it with a 10% uh, valuation fall on the December 2023 valuation. They've applied a 15% tenant default rate um, and applied rental growth assumptions of zero. Um a variable rate interest rates of a two percent lift from current values as well and also things like a more tightly controlled nhs schemes which just restricts their investment opportunities as well so they're um they are testing things Steve. they are testing um you know to make sure that they are financially strong enough to weather these kind of little storms ahead but the the, the tailwind you've got coming i guess or the reason that you would be you know looking at this company today and saying this could be a buy is that I mean, it's highly likely we have an incoming Labour government and if mm -hmm. Starmer lifts the spending um, on the NHS in the way that Blair did when Blair came in, I'm not saying that's a policy of Starmer because, let's be honest, Starmer doesn't know what his policies are at the moment. He just sort of changes them and sees what sees what, get the best, um, what gets the best reaction. He's a total flip-flopper. But if he, uh, if he comes in here and chooses to spend uh, heavily on... Um, growing out the capability of the nhs then this is something that php could uh, do quite well out of yeah if you think the nhs is going to go firstly I, i'm not sure i see much damage coming to the nhs in either direction but um it depends i suppose more on how they decide they want to try and operate things and and going through this kind of line this could be promising with a, a Labour government coming in. I also see that as quite likely at the moment. I think, um, well, I say quite likely. I, I don't want to say it's theirs to lose that. That's probably too strong here. There's still work to be done, I think, as you point out, partly communicating what on earth Labour's policies might 
be and how they would be uh, kind of fit together in certain ways because I suspect the narrative will be Labour doesn't know what it's doing, can't run stuff, isn't competent basically um, and they will need to convince people otherwise because if uh, it's a completely different Labour to your last kind of government but if you think all the way back to then and indeed with some of the kind of leadership candidates they've had in between then it's been perfectly true I think but things feel a bit different this time and I think there's probably enough sentiment behind them they could be a real uh uh, a real force and I'm looking forward to doing podcasting when that's happening uh, hmm. to be honest when we're going through a kind of election process it feels like it's been a little while since we had something like that to talk about it is a bit more exciting isn't it than the usual sort of humdrum never mind uh, anyway we've got something different coming up next week as well we've got an interview with someone who we're uh, we haven't spoken to before wait and find out and see who it is but we'll still be here talking about stocks we'll record that this week let it out next week um, but meanwhile Thanks for listening, and that brings us to the end of our show. Bye for now.